Thanks very much, Helmut. And uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Alan and, and Cynthia and the Board of Cares for allowing me to, uh, to speak this evening and participate. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly as an overview uh, to talk about the sections of the criminal code that deal with hate literature and hate propaganda. I'm not sure if Mr. Matas uh, uh, spoke of them, but I'm going to, just as an overview, let you know what they are. There are three charging sections within the criminal code that deal specifically with hate literature and hate propaganda. The first is section 318, subsection 1, and it basically says, it, it's generally referred to as advocating genocide, and it states everyone who advocates or promotes genocide is guilty of an indictable offense and is liable to a to, uh, term of imprisonment uh, not exceeding five years. This section then goes on to define genocide as any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part any identifiable group, namely by killing members of the group or by deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction. The next section is section 319, subsection 1, and it's basically called public incitement of hatred. And it states everyone who by communicating statements in any public place incites hatred against any identifiable group where such incitement is likely to lead to a breach of the peace is guilty of, and then it talks about the penalties. Section 319, subsection 2, is generally referred to as willful promotion of hatred. And it states everyone who by communicating statements other than in private conversation, willfully promotes hatred against any identifiable group is guilty of, and then it talks about the penalties. It's important to, uh, when we're discussing this, and I, I often bring this up because it's a pet peeve of mine, the um, Parliament, when they wrote these sections in 6970, uh, went on to di define identifiable group. In other words, the protected groups under these legislation. And they defined an identifiable group as uh, race, religion, color, and ethnic origin. Four categories, and very narrow categories. And that's the law as it sits right now. There is another section, section 320, which is not a, a, a charging section. Um, it basically allows the police to um, go to a justice, get a warrant, and enter a premise to seize hate literature, hate propaganda, for destruction. There's no charges under this section. It simply allows the, the police under the authority of the court to enter a premise, seize material, and have it destroyed. I only mention that because I'm going to return to it later uh, in, uh, in my discussion. So those are the laws that we work with. Now, when we're dealing with the Internet, or basically anything online, the, the general premise that I try to tell people is if it's illegal offline, it's illegal online. doesn't matter what it is, if it's fraud, if it's pornography, if it's uh, hate propaganda, hate literature, if it's illegal off the net, it's illegal on the net. So those, those are the general principles we work under. Now when you're dealing with the internet, as, as anybody that uh, has gone on the net uh, realizes, it presents some unique problems from a policing perspective. Because the criminal law requires that a particular individual be held responsible for certain acts committed. Now, when you're dealing with the net or even with you're dealing, if you're dealing with email, identifying that specific individual and putting them in front of the computer can present many difficulties. So basically what we have is we have to follow some very standard evidentiary procedures. We're still required to prove the identity of the offender. Now, when you're dealing with areas such as, uh, as Freenet or the uh, uh, Vancouver Net or any of these free services, um, anybody that deals with them knows that you can obtain an account with them under any name you, you wish. You're not required to produce any identification. Uh, you basically just fill out a little form saying my name is this and I want an account and you obtain an account. That pre presents some fairly significant difficulties from, a, from an enforcement perspective. The second thing we have to prove obviously is jurisdiction. Well that's, that's not terribly difficult uh, but it can present some issues uh, in, in certain cases. We also have to obviously uh, prove that the, the person intended to commit the offense and that again 
that the specific person that we're alleging committed committing the offense did actually commit the offense. And again, I return to the, the unfortunate uh, difficulty of, uh, from a policing perspective of physically putting someone behind a, a computer screen. And I can present many difficulties when you, when you think of the internet cafes and various accesses in libraries and, uh, and uh, universities and that sort of thing. As a matter of fact, we, uh, just to discuss that briefly, we're, we've run into a very specific problem with, uh, with some areas in the states um, where we're getting mass emails and I don't know if anyone in this room has received one, of something called a revolutionary bulletin, which is a uh, prose written by a, a person who uh, states his name as Dragon Glasovic, and he describes himself as a Serbian army commander. And it's a, a very racist, anti-Semitic uh, diatribe. And it's being emailed from various sites on the eastern seaboard of the United States. Now, I'm not an internet expert, so when it started appearing locally, and I saw where the, uh, the sites that it was coming from, the email accounts where it was coming from, uh, I contacted the, uh, the provider, which in this case was Netscape, which is excellent because they have some, uh, some very good security people. Well, these security people went to work, and, and uh, if you've ever had to deal with Netscape or any of these companies that are um, international providers, um, they're very conscious of problems such as uh, spamming and, um, and that sort of thing. And, and what this person was doing was basically spamming because he was sending out this revolutionary bulletin to mass numbers of people at a time. So they were very interested in it, and uh, they went away and did some work, and they couldn't track this individual down, which was kind of a surprise to me because uh, I thought when you're dealing with a, a company such as Netscape or Microsoft or any of these places, if, uh, if anybody can locate these individuals, they'd be able to. But unfortunately, with the advent of remailers and uh, um, side accounts and, and different things, it can, it can become very difficult. So that's where we're at with, with uh, basically investigations. Uh, we still are required to, to prove the same elements of the crime as we would with any other case. We have some difficulties dealing with ISPs. Um, many ISPs take a privacy issue, and probably rightfully so, when dealing with specific accounts um, or with uh, uh, websites that are contained on their servers, and uh, there is some um, reluctance to self-regulate. Uh, so we're looking at issues to deal with that. And Harinder mentioned uh, that the current human rights uh, annual report talks about possible amendments to the criminal code. Well, in October of 1998, uh, the hate crime team presented a paper for the Attorney General of the province. And he took it to a, a meeting of the Attorney Generals of, the, of Canada and also with the Department of Justice. And in that paper, we asked for several amendments to the sections of the code that deal with hate literature and hate propaganda. And I'm going to touch on those very briefly.